Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus. This is episode three of Five on Languages. If you haven't tuned in before, this is a show where we take a big topic, we break it into a bunch of different little topics so that we all understand it a little bit better. And this week, again, talking about language. So how does a language evolve? And then, you know, eventually die or survive, hopefully in some cases. In 8,000 BC, according to Michael Krauss's book, The World's Languages in Crisis, linguists believed 20,000 languages existed. And that was a while ago. Today, about 7,000 languages. That's still a lot of languages, but that's a huge cut. It's only a third of what used to exist. And it's hard to be 100% certain how many languages there are because there are so many dialects out there. So let me put that in context for you. The Amazon is divided into 400 tribes about, with 330 different languages and dialects. And we have to maybe get in there and write all of these down, but some of those tribes don't talk to the outside world. So those languages aren't even understood entirely. So where did all those languages go? If there used to be 20,000, now there's only 7,000. What happens? Well, the biggest one is economic growth and then globalization. Now, I know that's a big scapegoat these days, but this is important because as the global economy improves, we see one common language rise up. For example, languages in the UN, you speak a lot of English, you speak a lot of French, you speak some Mandarin. You don't really speak a lot of Italian. Does that mean Italian's less important? No, but you probably have to learn French or English or Mandarin or maybe Arabic in order to succeed in the international stage because those are the countries that are the most powerful right now. It wasn't always the case. French used to be the language of international business. Japanese used to be really important in international business and things kind of come and go. But as the global economy comes together and globalization becomes a bigger deal, some languages kind of get pushed to the wayside. That means that younger generations don't necessarily use their own native language, which is a problem in places like Ireland, where people don't speak Irish. They only speak English. Although, that's coming back. Additionally, as you introduce state schooling in developing areas, some of their regional accents, dialects, and languages get swept out of the way in order to teach everyone the same major language, especially in developing areas where an official language needs to be picked. A good example of language evolution is Afrikaans. Afrikaans is a low Franconian West Germanic language which descended from Dutch and was spoken mainly in South Africa and Namibia. Now you probably understand, hopefully, a little bit of the politics of how Africa was colonized by the Europeans and they kind of took over. It wasn't always the best of the deal, but they brought with them this language that they created called Afrikaans. It was also spoken in Australia, Belgium, Botswana, Canada, Germany, Lesotho, Malawi, Namibia, the Netherlands, New Zealand, the UK, the USA, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. That's 7.2 million people speak Afrikaans as their native language and a further 8 to 15 million people speak it as a second language. It's a pretty good common base. But there are some folks because of that history that see the Afrikaan language as a symbol of oppression, not surprised by that. Even after post-apartheid South Africa, this is still a problem. It's a civil issue. Maybe we can do a whole episode on this at some point, or maybe even a whole series on things like these. But you know, let us know in the comments if you'd be interested in that. But how did Afrikaans become so popular? Well, it's what the Dutch settlers used. And it developed different characteristics over time as it became its own language. So Afrikaans began replacing Malay as the language in Muslim schools in South Africa in about 1815. But it was being written in an Arabic alphabet. In 1850, newspapers, religious works, political papers, they start to pop up and they're using Afrikaans, but now they're using it with a Latin alphabet. So over the time between when it was starting to be used in schools and it started to be used in newspapers, it's morphed already, in just a few short years. By 1875, only 25 years later, a group published a collection of works, including grammars, dictionaries, religious works, and histories using Afrikaans, and in 1925, the South African government recognized Afrikaans as a real language rather than just Dutch slang. But nowadays, it's one of the official recognized languages in South Africa. There are 11 total languages, and it is one of them. So even though it came out of oppression, it slowly began being picked up by the people and then carried and eventually became an official language. 
Latin is another language that kind of has an interesting history. It was split into two groups. Latin, most people think of as a dead language. It's a language that a lot of other languages sprouted out of, but wasn't really a big deal on its own right. But that's not really true, because classical Latin was used in Roman politics, literature, and law. Of course, the church was also using Latin. Then you'd have vulgar Latin, which you spoke in everyday life. That was with your homies down. You just speak in vulgar Latin to everybody. And vulgar Latin never really went extinct. It evolved into modern Romance languages. Makes sense. It's the language you're speaking to each other. And around the year six to 800, it became what we call today Romance languages, which are things like French and Italian and Spanish. Classical Latin, however, that is the one that died. That pretty much dead as of the 19th century. I mean, people still learn to speak Latin today, but they do so because the vulgar Latin became so popular. And they wanna know the base language for those Romance languages. So even though Latin died and Afrikaans lived, there are a lot of other languages out there that we aren't gonna be able to talk to because there are so many. UNESCO's Atlas of the World's Languages in Danger lists almost 3,000 languages as endangered. Endangered languages. There are even anthropologists and linguists dedicated to going out into the world and absorbing these languages, learning all they can about them before they disappear. There are people whose languages, they are the last native speaker of that language. They're the last ones. And they have to talk to those people. They have to find them. They have to understand that language. You may be thinking, why? You know, we've got enough languages between Japanese and English and French and Italian and Arabic and Mandarin and all of these languages. Don't we have enough stuff in the world? No, we don't. I've always thought English sucked when it came to a lot of richness in the world. Luckily, we have people like the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. Check out that channel if you haven't. It's fantastic, where they make up new words because there are words that are missing. Even with thousands of languages, we have words that are missing. And these languages have ways to describe our world that other languages may never have thought of. Here's a good example to kind of end this episode. In English, there is one word for love. One. I love my mom, I love you know, my friend, I love my brother, I love my girlfriend, I love my wife, I love my whatever, my dog. That's all the same thing, it's all love, right? Then you have to quantify what that means. I really love you, I sort of love you, I love you as a friend. All of these things are because we don't have the right words. We can't be describing that emotion very well. We're actually sucking at describing love in English. In Arabic, there are many ways to describe love. There's the love of missing someone. There's romantic love. There's infatuated love. There's family love. There's friend love. These are all different words. It's not, oh, this is friend love. It's a whole different word. Now imagine languages around the world and how they're describing things that we don't have words for. Feelings and, you know, the colors of a sunset. What if you could describe that in one word and everybody knew it? Wouldn't that be amazing? If we lost that, if we lose these languages and we only had one word for love, the world would be infinitely duller a place. Did you ever have to learn a dead language in your education? Tell us down in the comments and make sure you subscribe for more Test Tube Plus. Come back every single day. We're here all the time talking about cool stuff like this. Click here now to see our earlier episodes on languages, how they affect your brain and how they make you better. You can also find the links in the description if you're on mobile. And thank you for tuning in to Test Tube Plus. If you have any questions or comments, come find me on Twitter as well. I'm at Trace Dominguez. See you tomorrow. Yeah.